Pulmonary function tests are exactly what they sound like they would be. They're designed to test lung function. There are a variety of different functional tests that can be conducted. We're going to focus on spirometry. In uh, pre-pandemia, we would have done spirometry in the lab. Um, I'm kind of disappointed that we actually don't get to do this because it's a lot easier to learn by doing. Nevertheless, it is what it is. So let's go ahead and take a look at what spirometry is. And to understand spirometry, I'm going to talk about how it used to be done. It's not actually done this way anymore now that we have fancy dancy computers and things that can measure airflow. It's, it's the mechanics of it is a little bit different. But traditional wet spirometry helps to understand the concepts of what we're actually looking at when we, we measure um, this process. Spirometry is designed to measure lung volume. And the way it used to work is, is we would take this inverted bell, okay, this, this uh, gas-filled chamber filled with oxygen and, and a gas mixture, okay, and I'm going to outline this here in this purple. This is actually part of that gas, that bell, that chamber. And that bell then contains air, okay, that's what's in here. The chamber would be inverted so that it floats on top of water. Okay, and you can actually see this water. I'll go ahead and color it in a little bit darker right here so you can see it. Now notice that we have a tube here. Let me highlight the opening here. Okay, we have this respiratory tube that is connected to our patient. Okay, our patient would form a tight seal over that tube with his or her mouth. Generally speaking, they would either plug their nose or wear a, a little plug on top of the nose so that air cannot go through the nose and that all airflow must be through the mouth. This individual would then breathe in and with each inhalation, okay, with each inhalation, they would draw air in from the bell. They don't have direct, ac direct access to the atmosphere anymore. All they can do is breathe in whatever is available within that bell, and that would enter into their lungs. As they remove air from the bell, the bell would sink deeper into the water because of a decrease in buoyancy of this glass bell filled with air with less air. It's going to be less buoyant and it's going to sink into the water. As it sinks, it would tug on this little pulley right here, and that pulley would be hooked up to an instrument that is attached to a pen. The pen would then draw traces on this cylinder that contains graph paper, and as the cylinder spins, as it would rotate during this process, okay, so it's going to be rotating, the pin traces a line on that. So when the bell pulls down, the pin goes up and the graph that is drawn on the paper moves upward. Then when this individual would exhale, the air would flow through the tube out of the lungs, right, into the bell, and the bell would fill with air, which would increase the buoyancy. The bell would rise and the pin would go down. And based on this process, we get these tracings on the piece of paper that is rotating on this spinning cylinder. And you can actually see what that would look like in this graph shown on the right, an idealized graph, of course. But as we inhale, of course, inhalation would um, be would be increased or would be due to an increase in lung volume. And so inhalation would f increase the volume of our lungs and that would be shown or measured based on um, how the bell drops down into the water and the pin goes up. Exhalation on the other hand is going to decrease the volume in our lungs and that would be made, you know, the tracing that would be made would occur because as we exhale the air in the bubble and the chamber increases and the bell increases, the bell rises, but because it's hooked to that pulley mechanism, the pin goes down. And so we get this tracing uh, up 
and down and up and down with each inhalation and each exhalation as the individual connected to the spirometer breathes. We call the tracing the spiral graph, the process is called spirometry, okay, and it measures these lung volumes. Now, as I mentioned, these days we actually do it differently. We have, uh, you still breathe through a mouthpiece into a tube through a filter, but um, the airflow is measured and the information is transduced or changed into an electrical signal and you just get a printout on this computer a reading on the monitor and a printout um, and it's a little bit of a different process but it's still based on the same concepts the same ideas or, or physics of respiration now a spirometer, spirometer let's go ahead and look at a spirograph that tests lung function and lung volumes and we'll start with what we uh, what are called volumes now we have two different terminology using here volumes and capacities and um, the volumes are things that need to be directly measured by these respiratory tests whereas ca capacities can be ca calculated by adding two or more volumes or subtracting a volume from a different volume and so they can be calculated mathematically Let's look at the volumes first. And I'm going to zoom in on this graph a little bit so you can get a little bit of a better look at it. And I want you to get into the habit, I've mentioned this before, but I want to re-emphasize this, of really dissecting figures and graphs. You can gain quite a bit of understanding by taking a very close look at these pictures. And it can save you time from trying to tease out information in the text. Humans tend to be visual even if you have other primary learning methods, perhaps you're an auditory learner, perhaps you're a uh, kinesiology, kin kinetics type of learner. Nevertheless, almost every human has a very strong visual component to it because we are just a very visually oriented species. And so looking at things and dissecting these graphs and, and um, really pondering them can be a great study tool. So we're gonna do that with this graph. The first thing I want you to look at here is the y-axis. Um, over here we have this phrase here, or this uh, term being used. We're looking at lung volume and we're studying it in cubic centimeters. Okay. Now a cubic centimeter is written in this example as cc's. You could also write cubic centimeters by going cm to the cube. Right, that would make sense to you. It just so happens that one cubic centimeter, one cc, is equal to one milliliter worth of volume. Okay, so we use cc's more often in the medical world. Uh, if you look at your standard syringe, for example, many of them actually have cc's written on them, and some of them will have milliliters, but understanding this relationship between cc and, and milliliters will save you a lot of grief as you go on into in your studies. We're gonna look first um, at what we call tidal breathing. Tidal breathing is the same as quiet breathing. It is your normal breath as you are at rest. Okay, quiet breathing. For the average 70 kilogram man, each breath, each inhalation is going to bring in approximately 500 milliliters of air into the respiratory system. Now, 500 milliliters of air, not every one of those milliliters makes it into the alveolar sacs. Remember that the respiratory system includes the conducting zones as well. So some of that air, in fact, approximately 150 milliliters of that air will actually remain in the trachea, the nasal cavity, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and not in the alveolar sacs. Nevertheless, as our skeletal muscles work to enlarge our lung volume, 500 milliliters is approximately how much um, an average human male um, would breathe. Smaller males would breathe, have a smaller tidal volume. Women, smaller women tend to have a smaller tidal volume. Um, and of course, larger individuals would have a larger volume, but 500 is the average that we're gonna be working with here. Now, you inhale 500 milliliters during your inspiration 
and when you exhale, you exhale 500 milliliters. Okay, and so you're gonna notice here, as we follow this along, if we, if um, just to kinda, and by the way, drawing and following things along can really help both the visual and the kinetic learner because you are using motion. So follow this along. We've got our inhalation and our exhalation. Another inhalation and another exhalation. Another inhalation, another exhalation. Another inhalation, another exhalation. And we're gonna stop right there. Now, during this normal quiet breathing, okay, that tidal volume with each breath, we move approximately 500 milliliters of atmospheric air into and out of our lungs. In a functional test, you would be asked to breathe quietly for a given length of time, perhaps a minute, perhaps five breaths. In lab, we do five breaths. Here we only see uh, four complete respiratory cycles. In this graph, the individual doing this test would then have been asked to breathe out, to expel as much air as possible to force every ounce of air out of their lungs that they could. And they would do this by contracting the internal intercostals as well as really strongly contracting the abdominal muscles to force that air out. And in so doing, um, they would expel a specific volume of, of air um, in addition to, okay, the 500 milliliters. So they would expel the 500 milliliters. Let me color that in yellow. So here's my 500 milliliters that is my tidal volume. And then on top of that, the area shown in pink would be the milliliters that are expelled by recruiting um, muscles that are used in forced or active breathing. Okay. This extra volume of air is called your expiratory reserve volume. Expiratory reserve volume. Now let's go back over to the y-axis. I wanna sh make sure you're noticing something here. First and foremost, let's look at this. When we inhale and exhale during tidal breathing, we're not starting at zero milliliters. In fact, we're starting at approximately 2200 milliliters of air that is already in our lungs before we inhale. When we inhale, we then add that extra 500. So let's go 27 for this line right here. But notice this part here, okay? There is 22 milliliters of air present in the lungs during quiet breathing, even when you exhale, okay? Even when you exhale. Expiratory reserve volume removes an additional, let's look at that line, an additional, based on this graph, I'm gonna estimate it as a, an additional um, 1100, so let's say that this is 1100 milliliters right there. And so we remove that additional air that's my expiratory reserve volume. From, from here to here is my expiratory reserve volume, right there. So what is this? This is what we call my residual volume. This is the amount of air that remains in the lungs uh, at all times. We have at least, at least we have about 1100 or, or 1200 milliliters of air present in our lungs at any given time. And this residual volume is due to that um, interpleural space. Which has that negative uh, pressure compared to the atmosphere. And of course, we also have to give credit to surfactant. Both of these factors prevent the alveoli from collapsing. And so in the healthy individual, we do not ever tap into that residual volume. Now sometimes trauma, let's imagine you get punched really hard in the stomach or maybe you fall out of a tree 
or maybe you you know fall off a horse or you know you use your imagination and you have the breath knocked out of you the physical act of trauma that impact can force a little bit of air out of you and b- lower your residual volume and that actually is what gives you the sensation of having a hard time catching your breath because Your lungs become a little bit deflated more so than usual and you have to engage more muscles in order to restore that residual volume. And so the first uh, breath or so as you struggle to breathe there is about restoring the residual volume before you can start working on anything else. But that only occurs during trauma. It's not a normal type of event. And of course, if you were to have a collapsed lung, you might see that residual volume drop down to closer to zero. But for the healthy person, we always have some present there. Now, once we've identified our expiratory reserve volume, we would be asked to go back to normal quiet breathing again for a few breaths. And then from there, we would be asked, if we were doing this functional test in this particular example, to breathe in as hard and fast as we possibly can. And so this breathing in, this inhalation, this would engage not only your diaphragm and your external intercostals, but also the scalene, the sternocleidal um, mastoids, the um, pectoralis minor, all of those accessory muscles would be utilized to enlarge that thoracic cavity as much as possible to draw in the maximum amount of air that you can draw in at at any given time. And that maximal amount of air, as you first breathe, the first part of it, this first 500 milliliters is what you would normally breathe in during um, quiet breathing. The remainder, this part right here, let's do it in a nice turquoise, is what we call our inspiratory reserve volume. Okay, It's the amount of air that you can breathe in in excess of the tidal volume. And so it, it brings that air into our respiratory system and that would be our maximum ability to expand our lungs, the maximal volume that we can reach. And that's my expi- inspiratory reserve volume. Let's go ahead and look at my capacities. We're gonna flip over to this one here and, and take a look at my capacities. By the way, I forgot to mention this, so we're going to actually go right back here. This particular graph doesn't show it, but this x-axis is my timeline. And if we were to measure, let's say from here to here, this would be the number of breaths. We would use this information to calculate our breaths per minute. Normal respiratory rate is about 12 breaths to about 20 breaths per minute. There's a number of factors that will affect these. Remember that the skeletal muscle can become stronger and our respiratory muscles are skeletal muscles. So the more you work out, especially aerobic um, exercise, the stronger your, your, your muscles are within your respiratory system and the better able you are to move air. And so you would need to breathe fewer times. Um, other factors affecting that would be, you know, again, age, physical fitness, um, size, your height, and so forth. And, and essentially how well you can meet your energy needs. Respiration, remember, is about maintaining homeostasis. And so our respiratory rate will function based on our oxygen levels in our bloodstream, our carbon dioxide levels in our bloodstream, our hydrogen ion levels in our bloodstream, and the needs of our body for each of these factors. And so, you know, kind of keep that in mind and remember that that is what the function of the respiratory system is and that's what we're gonna kind of keep going back to. Our capacities then, let's move on and look at the capacities. Capacities, as I mentioned, can be calculated. 
So we'll start on the left and move for on to the right. The first capacity that you need to know is your inspiratory capacity. And that capacity, we'll put that in purple, I guess, is your tidal volume. This first portion would be the tidal volume plus your inspiratory reserve volume. I want to make sure I'm consistent with my colors. So plus your inspiratory reserve volume. That's your inspiratory capacity. Okay. Notice inspiratory reserve volume excludes, right? Excludes that tidal volume when it terms when it comes to measuring. Now, your vital capacity is arguably the most important type of capacity here that we have in that um, it's going to include your inspiratory reserve volume, okay, your tidal volume, and the expiratory reserve volume. So the vital capacity is the sum of all of these volumes here. And it tells you when you are exercising, when you are working hard, how much volume you can actually move with one maximal inhalation and one maximal exhalation. So you inhale as hard as you can to do this functional test as fast as you can, and then you force every ounce of air you possibly can force out of you to measure your vital capacity to figure that out and you add in those volumes together. Functional residual capacity is um, the, let's see what color, right. that one works. This functional residual capacity right here refers to essentially just your expiratory reserve volume plus your residual volume. Okay, expiratory reserve volume plus your residual volume, and it essentially is the normal reserve volume when you're at rest. Okay, and then total lung capacities are going to include your residual volume plus your expiratory reserve volume plus your tidal volume plus your inspiratory reserve volume. And this essentially is the ability of your lungs to inflate. This is how much air you can actually hold in your lungs. You can never go higher than the maximum value without damaging your lungs, and you're never gonna go, obviously, past zero, even if your lungs were to collapse. And so that functional, that total lung capacity essentially is telling us how big our lungs are and how much gas our lungs can hold. Now, in terms of priorities, what am I most likely to ask for on the exam? Um, let's go ahead and prioritize this with vital capacity being the most important, probably tied with my tidal volume in terms of understanding those two. We'll go ahead and put our total lung capacity at three. And let's go ahead and name my residual volume at four. Inspiratory volume, reserve volume, five and, and six. Actually, that would be tied for five, so let's go ahead and put these two, five, six, and seven. These are my priorities, and so when it comes to writing my exams, this is just simply the um, types of capacities or volumes I'm most likely to ask you about. It's good planning to learn all of them, but if you are really struggling, at very least, you need to know tidal capacity, I'm sorry, tidal volume, vital capacity, total lung capacity, reserve, residual volume. Those are probably the most important volumes and capacities to know.